morning again. What would Jesus undo? Anybody ever have a bracelet? Everybody, everybody ever had one of the WWJD bracelets? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's a little, years ago, we, everybody used to wear these little bracelets, right? They, they were a little bracelet that, that just had WWJD on it, and it was, stood for what would Jesus do if you're not familiar with it, and what, what would he do? And, and really, I'll give you a little background about that bracelet. I don't know if you know where that originated or if somebody just thought that up or it was some thing that happened in the 90s or, or whatever, but in 1896, there was a pastor by the name of Charles Sheldon, and he wrote a book and the book was called In His Steps. And in that book, it sold, in that book, he really talked about this concept of what would Jesus do. And really just kind of talked about in everyday life and everyday circumstances as we, as, we, as, as we go through our day and as we're faced with decisions and as we're faced with, with other people and, and, and disagreements or, or whatever. He, he, he wrote just this simple concept of what would Jesus do in this situation. And so about a hundred years later, uh, there was this resurgence uh, of WWJD from this book, and then everybody started wearing bracelets with WWJD. What, what would Jesus do? And it, and it really is great. I don't know if you've ever, uh, if you've ever thought about that or walked through life and, and, and been faced with a circumstance and then just stop for a second and ask yourself that question, what would Jesus do in this situation? And a lot of people like to throw that at me when I'm driving. <laughs> Trent, what would Jesus do? Well, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't do that. Uh, but, uh, but we have that. And so really what I want to talk about over the next couple of weeks, kicking off a new series, and what, what I want to spend some time talking about is, are, are some things that, that, uh, that Jesus maybe would undo. What would Jesus undo? And when we look through Scripture, and if you have a red letter edition of your Bible, and you look through your Bible, and you look at the words of Jesus, and the things that he said, and the things that caused him angst, or things that, that made him upset, or things that disappointed Jesus, you can read through those, those red letters in your Bible, and you can, you, can, you can focus on a couple of things that really just kind of rub Jesus the wrong way. And so I think there's probably a lot of things that he would undo in our society and culture today, but I want to focus on about four things. We're going to spend four weeks really, and, and next week, I'm really, really, honestly, I'm really, I'm excited about this message today, but I'm excited about the message next week, and you won't want to miss that. It, it's, it's going to be a good one, but um, not that today isn't, so uh, it may not be. <laughs> But really, I want to, and, and so we're going to talk about worship and hypocrisy and pride and some other things. But this morning, I want to I talk to you about uh, a topic um, that I like to refer to as spiritual indifference. And that's a, it's kind of a big word. But um, so I want to, I want to ask you this. Have you ever, have any of you ever shopped for a present for someone, like someone special, you spent a ton of time, like we've done that, right? But, but like really like you've you've poured yourself into this gift. Anybody ever done that? Like you're like, man, you you've thought about it for months ahead of time. You planned, uh, you you did things. You know, my kids surprised us with a 25 anniversary thing, which was weird. But I shouldn't be that old. But uh, I was thankful for. But I could tell they put thought and effort in, into that and in, in doing that, and it just it means so much to you. But I don't know if you've ever done that. If you've ever like maybe at Christmas for your kids, you've you've tried to figure out that perfect gift. You ever have somebody in your life? Maybe it's your husband or spouse on an anniversary or or your kids, and you've you've done and it, you've you've you have found the perfect gift, and you you've spent probably more money than you should have, and you spent way more time on it than you should have, and you've personalized it, and it's special, and it means something and and there's this anticipation have you ever you know what I'm talking about like you can't wait to give it to them and you know everybody gets out their phone to record it because you know it's just going to be one of those moments that they're just going to melt down and sob and thank you so much for this gift that you have poured out yourself for anybody ever done that like and then has anybody ever had like the big letdown you know like you give this gift and then you're and they're like Oh, thanks. You're like, what? 
But that, my dad was impossible to shop for when he was alive. I, he, it's like, I, we, he didn't, he, he, I, for some reason, we could never, I just could never, like, uh, every Christmas, my brothers and I would be like, what, what are you getting, Dad? I don't know. What's he, I, he doesn't do anything. He preaches. He prays. You know, that's what he does. And so how do you, you know, what do you give a guy like that? And so we, you know, every Christmas rolled around. And, and I can remember there were uh, I, I, several Christmases that we would buy this gift that we thought was going to be really super special for Dad. And sometimes, you know, it was, it was so expensive that my brothers and I would go in on it, and, and we would we'd give it to Dad, and um, uh, he, you know, and he, he would thank us. He would igno- at least acknowledge the gift, <laughs> but, but then, like, I would go to his house, like, six months later, and the gift is still in the box, like, sitting dusty in the garage or something. You're like, wow, that I really meant something to Dad. <laughs> it, it, it's just this huge letdown, and so I want you to just imagine for a second, um, Jesus, he steps out of heaven, becomes human, walks the faith of the earth, endures all kinds of trials, suffers immensely on the cross. He endures torture, We get to experience the forgiveness of sin, life to the full. We have the living word at our fingertips every single day. We have access to God through prayer. He charges us with spiritual purpose and he gives us the same spirit. We have the same power within us that raised Jesus from the dead. And yet we go day in and day out without ever thinking about it. Just imagine, God has given this incredible gift, extremely personal, designed for you specifically, amazing gift of life and hope and joy and eternity, and we just leave it on the shelf a lot of days. So what would Jesus undo? I think he would undo spiritual indifference. And that's a word we're going to talk about a little bit about. And the idea is really not new to our culture. I mean, if you ask somebody, we're kind of the, eh, culture. (laughs) You ever notice that? Hey, how you doing? Eh, all right. One of the questions I like to ask people, I ask people all the time, hey, how's your life? I, I can't tell you the number of times I get, eh, life. It's just, eh. What are you excited about? Eh. How's life? What's God doing in your life? Eh. It's like a cow or sheep. Eh. Eh. Well, that's what I want to talk about this morning. In the book of Revelations, Jesus wrote letters to seven churches, and some of you probably read these letters, but I want to focus on one that he wrote uh, to a church called Laodicea. In his extremely wealthy city, and Jesus wrote right in the beginning of Revelations, he wrote seven chapters. If you haven't read them, I would encourage you to go and read these seven letters that Jesus wrote to these churches. And then for me as your pastor, I just wonder, sometimes, I can't help but read those letters and wonder what kind of letter Jesus would write to us. <laughs> you know, what would his letter to Salem Grace look like? What would it say about us as a church, you and me? And here, but we get it. We get a glimpse of what Jesus wrote to Laodicea. And just some background about this city: it was an extremely wealthy city. About thirty-five years earlier, it had been destroyed by an earthquake and it had been leveled. And they rebuilt Laodicea, rebuilt this city, and it was magnificent. Like uh, they must have got, they must have had really good insurance. I don't know, because they, they built it back really, really well. I mean, it was, it, it was incredible. Uh, you know, they, they, did all, they had theaters and, and stadiums and, and lavish public baths, which just kind of grosses me out a little bit. But uh, lavish public baths, and they had shopping centers. And, and it, you know, think about like a, a modern like Dubai or something. That's what Laodicea would have been. It was, they had wealth. They had, they had rebuilt 
uh, tremendously. And so they felt they really just kind of had all they need. In fact, they actually piped in water from two places, uh, Colossae and Heropolis, which kind of sounds like where superheroes are from. But, uh, but they piped in water because Heropolis had cold water and, and, and Heropolis had warm water, hot water. And they built these aqueducts so that they would have hot and cold water, which is amazing. But, the, but, they, but they ran into a problem. <laughs> Because by the time that the water made its way down through these aqueducts and where it was supposed to be, it wasn't, it wasn't hot and it wasn't really cold. It had just kind of become room temperature. And so that's why in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 15 through 16, Jesus says this to that church. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. That's what Jesus says to this church. And just so you know, the, the word spit in that passage, if you look that up, it, uh, it's a word, it's a Greek word, emeo, is the, is the Greek word that was used in the original translation, and it actually means, it translates to vomit, to vomit forth, <laughs> to throw up. If you look at your life this past week, I just want you to ask as we go through this message, were you full of passion and energy for Jesus and the things of his kingdom? Or were you and are you spiritually stale and indifferent? Just a, just a question for all of us, including myself. Are you, were you incredibly passionate this past week about your walk with Christ and what he's done and the gift that you had been given? Or are we just incredibly stale? So what Jesus was saying in this passage is, He's basically saying you're, you're spiritually stale. You're, you're depressingly detached. Hot and cold serve a purpose. Lukewarm makes me want to throw up. Basically what Jesus is saying. After all I've done for you, after all I've given, after all I've empowered you to do, you don't even care. And it doesn't just break my heart. It makes me sick at my stomach. That's what Jesus is saying to this church. Wow. <laughs> Just imagine if I walked up here and said, hey guys, got a letter. A letter from Jesus today. <laughs> Apparently we make him sick. <laughs> that's, what, that's what this church is dealing with. In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, I know what you've been doing. I see how you live. I know what you did this week. I see, he said, in the beginning of that verse, he says, I know your deeds. You're neither hot, cold nor hot. In other words, I know how you've been living. You think, you're, you think you've got it all. And I think there are, there are a couple causes to spiritual indifference. And I think the first one is this. If you're taking notes, it's self-sufficiency. That's, that is the first cause to spiritual indifference. Revelations 3.17, he's still talking to the same church in the next verse, and he says this, you say, I am rich, I have required wealth, and do not need a thing, but you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. In other words, what, they were, what this church was saying, hey, we're good, we rebuilt, we've got theaters, we've got, we've got stuff, and I think, honestly, I think that's where some of us live. Self-sufficiency is the mother of spiritual indifference. Because you think, when we think we have it under control, I've got money in the bank, I'm sitting there with a fat savings account, I'm really not worried about paying any bills, I got a house, I know where I'm going to live, I've got two cars, three cars, four cars, I've got a hundred pairs of shoes, I've got, I've, got place, I've got food on the table and food in the pantry and food that I have to throw away because I didn't need, I, 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 we're, I'm I'm good. None of us would probably really say that out loud. 
Like, I don't need you, God, but really, do, is there anything in your life that you are absolutely depending upon God for this week? Like, if he doesn't show up, it's gonna be bad. And I think when we're self-sufficient and we, you know, we can get up and go to work, I, actually, when we get, Cheryl and I do this, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not any different than you. <laughs> Cheryl and I do that. We get in a pinch financially. We're like, okay, we need, we need to move here, to, move some money from here to here, and, or I need to do this or, or do this. Or, you know, in my head, I have it all worked out. I'm self-sufficient. And I think when we become self-sufficient, you know, we just say, hey, I'm, I'm good. I've got, I've got my coffee, Mark. <laughs> got my coffee, got my, we've got our air condition, we have blue puffy chairs, I have my iPhone, I have Amazon Prime, I ordered a Snuggie, I'm gonna watch Netflix and just chill out here, I'm good. And that's pretty much what Laodicea was doing. They were completely self-sufficient. They had water, they had theaters, they had places to go, things to do, we have worldly wealth, but we're spiritually bankrupt. Our lives are full of stuff and empty of meaning. That's the first cause. <laughs> I think the second cause is this, is distractions of the world. It's just our everyday distractions. I don't think, I don't think we get up and intentionally, and I believe this about our church, because I believe we have a great church. I honestly believe that, and I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> you, you don't know, I, I just miss being at our church. I love our church. It was just at District Assembly, and I get to talk to other pastors and be other places, so I, I want you to know that I love our church. We're, we're incredibly blessed here at Salem. But I, so I, so I think that, I don't, I don't believe that we intentionally, I don't think that any one of us actually get up every morning and say, well, I don't need you, God. I'm good today. Nobody, I, don't, I don't know that we necessarily say that. I think a lot of times it's distractions of the world that cause us to be spiritually indifferent. Mark talks about it. Jesus actually talks about it in Mark chapter 4, verse 19, talking about the parable of the sower, preached on it a couple weeks back. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. And I think it's our desire for stuff. It's, it's just the, the daily grind. I have bills to play, I have bills to pay, I have places to be, I have people to meet, I have selfies to take. We're just busy. I have dishes, laundry, I gotta get the kids to practice, I gotta get the oil changed, I got, I got a meeting. <clears throat> you know, and then we have all these different causes. I've got to save the unborn and save the whales and stop using foam cups at McDonald's so we can save the earth. I'm still bitter about that. There was a quote this week that I read. It says, feeling numb isn't the absence of feeling, but the sensation of feeling too much at once. <laughs> I'll read that again. Feeling numb isn't the absence of feeling, but the sensation of feeling too much at once. Anybody ever feel like they're just completely overwhelmed? <laughs> Do you ever feel like you just have too much going on in your life? <laughs> like, I mean, it, it just almost gets ridiculous. Our schedules are incredibly busy. We're, we're tied to our phones. I was on vacation last week, loved it. <laughs> Didn't have an agenda. Didn't have any place to be. You know, Cheryl, people, sometimes even going on vacation is stressful for people. Like, where are you going? You know, Cheryl, they asked, they asked me, people asked me what we did, and I'll just tell you, Cheryl and I, we got in the car and drove. People are like, you didn't fly? Nope. I wasn't in any hurry. We just drove. Where'd you go? Everywhere. Wherever we wanted to. It was fantastic. <laughs> I love it. I would recommend it sometime. We have agendas and stuff, and, and, and so many people that I run to, you know, we just, we just have all these distractions. And I think all of these distractions and all of the junk and the stuff that we can't say no to rob us from a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And so I think that the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke out the word and make us spiritually indifferent. You ever feel that way? Have you ever just come to church and just felt like, oh, just nothing? (laughs) Sometimes I feel that way. And I pray that God will just renew my spirit. And you know what? If I'm honest with you this morning, a lot of times when I feel that way at church, it's because I haven't put the time to spend with him in the week. I'm just being really blatantly honest. So many people that I run into have a little bit of Jesus. And so I'm just gonna call it the way I see it. I think people have just enough Jesus to make them feel better about themselves. Well, I prayed, I got baptized, I go to church every now and then. I did something to help someone. But for the most part, most people that I see, a lot of people I see, are more excited about this life than the next. They're more excited about the stuff going on on earth and here in your everyday life than you are about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm not trying to beat anybody up, it's just reality. I, I, you know, we do just, uh, there's people that do just enough, but not enough to make us grieve over our sinfulness and inspire us to pursue Jesus every day. We're living with lukewarm indifference and it makes Jesus sick to his stomach. I think there are six things Six indicators that we're living a lukewarm life or a spiritually indifferent, lukewarm life. The first one is this. Just a little test if you want to check yourself this morning. First one, we're more concerned with impressing people than living for God. And I'm just going to ask you to be really honest. This this message hit me pretty hard. (laughs) To be honest with myself, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 says this. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and holy. Paul was talking to Timothy and me. I think, man, if that doesn't describe some of our culture today, I don't know what does. Lovers of themselves, let's take another selfie. Please like me, like me, like me, like me. Vacation picks up. If we're so concerned with what other people think about us, we will never be living completely for what God thinks about us. So the first indicator that we're living in Luke Warren is we're more concerned with impressing other people than of God. The second thing is this. We're obsessed with life on earth rather than eternity. We're obsessed with what I have over what I'm called to do. We concern ourselves with stuff. Our stuff is a distraction. And scripture says if we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. Are you more concerned, just a question this morning, are you more concerned with your life here than your life in eternity? Third thing, this one's huge. We rationalize our sin and live without truly fearing God. We say stuff like, well, I'm not as bad as them. In our mind, probably not out loud. We say, well, you know, selfishness really isn't a big deal. Everybody gossips. We give it new names. We give our sin different names. You ever notice that? Well, it's not porn. It's it's adult entertainment. (laughs) It's not an adultery. It's an affair. We give it a different name. It's not sin. It's just a mistake. (laughs) No, it's sin. But we justify it. We justify the things in our lives. Make it sound good to us. Fourth thing. We believe in Jesus, but we rarely, this is this one. We believe in Jesus, but we rarely share our faith. When is the last time you told someone about the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. When is it? I want you to think in your mind. When is the last time that I've actually had a conversation with somebody about giving their life to Christ? 
because of what he did in my life. And I could share my story. Not that you could quote scripture and, and point him to the scripture and the word. You don't have to do that to share Jesus. Do you know that? You just have to say, hey, you know what? <laughs> Here's what he's done in my life. When is the last time you even met somebody that didn't know Jesus? When is the last time you hung out, had dinner with somebody that is lost? We believe in Jesus. A lot of us here, everybody, I guarantee everybody would say, if you're here this morning, you probably believe in Jesus. Maybe not. There may be somebody here that doesn't and wrestling with that, and that's okay. I'm glad you're here. We should talk. <laughs> But I just wonder if, if, if the reason we don't share our faith is because we don't believe, maybe it's because of the first one, we're, we're concerned about what other people think about us. <laughs> or maybe it's just because we, we, don't, we don't actually truly, at our core, and of who we are, believe that the gospel is true. If you believe that the gospel is true, and that Jesus actually came to earth, suffered and died, bled on the cross, was buried and was resurrected, and through that action, we are saved and have the hope of eternity. If you truly believe that, and you really were concerned about people that are around you, that your friends or your relatives, people you work with, people you go to school with, people that you run into with every day, if we were genuinely concerned about those people, if we really believe the gospel is true and that there is a heaven and there is a hell, and someday somebody's going to die and go to hell, people that you know are going to die and go to hell, there would be a sense of urgency about us. I would think. We have the answer, but we don't tell anybody about it. We're walking around with the cure of cancer in our back pocket, sitting in a dusty Bible on our dresser. We don't feel the need to invite anybody to even church. We don't feel the need to tell anybody about Jesus. Jesus said, if you confess me, for my father. We believe in Jesus, but we rarely share our faith. Maybe an indicator that you're living a lukewarm life. Number five, we only turn to God. This is a huge one. See this all the time. We only turn to God when we need him. This is what I like to call spare tire Jesus. <laughs> this is spare tire Jesus mentality right here. This is where you get into a jam and you're like, oh man, I need to break out Jesus. Let me go get him out of the trunk. Woo, I'm glad I had him. But then when we fix the tire, we put him back. Oh, I'm gonna put you back in there, Jesus, till next time I need you. Shut the trunk lid. Spare a tire, Jesus. Rather than seeking him daily, we seek him when he benefits us. I can't tell you the number of people I talk to that get into a jam in their relationships with their marriage or, or financially or they're wrestling with an addiction or, or whatever it is. Or the people that I don't, and there are, there are people that, have, that, that come here, I'm just being really brutally honest, that come on and, and, will, and they'll be really, really consistent for about three or four weeks when they're in a jam. But when that jam starts to lift, I don't see him anymore. It's really important that they get right with Christ in that time. You get a diagnosis, man. Somebody gets diagnosed with cancer, whoo, Jesus out of that trunk, quick. You have a tragedy in your life, whoo, Jesus comes out of the trunk, quick. Someone dies, oh God, help us. It's not a God I fear and worship. It's just somebody I use when I'm in a jam. And the last one is this. And this one was, <laughs> I, I'm preaching myself this morning. We're not much different from the world. We watch the same movies. We enjoy the same music have the same morals, it's okay to sleep around. It's okay to live with your boyfriend or girlfriend or have sex before you're married. Or we, we have the same morals. We raise our kids the same way. We spend our money the same way. 
We divorce as often. Going to church, we go to church if there's nothing better going on. Our priorities are the same. We're just not much different than people who aren't professing to be followers of Christ. And gradually, we have this slow fade until we're spiritually indifferent and we're just <laughs> flat in our relationship with Christ. And I'm, I know this is a tough message and I'm not trying to beat anybody up. I'm just trying to be extre- extremely honest. And I, I'm telling you, this, this hit me too. And I, 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 trust me, I, I don't get up. I, I, I'm, I'm a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. I love, I love Jesus. I love what he's done in my life. I love what he's done in my family. I'm incredible, incredibly grateful for the gift that I've been given. But as your pastor, I don't live like that every day. I just don't. I don't pray. You know, sometimes I get up here to preach, and one of the prayers that I pray every Sunday before I get up here is, God, I hope you got this. Because <laughs> I don't. I, and you think I'm kidding, but I pray that prayer every Sunday. I'm dependent upon him. But sometimes my life doesn't reflect that. And I was reading through those things. I'm like, yep, I was checking boxes. That's me. That's me. I preach. My life happens to me too. You know, stuff comes in. I get it. We're busy. We get distracted by things, wants and desires, and Satan puts stuff in our path constantly to trip us up. And I believe wholeheartedly that every single one of us, are, there is a war raging. I, I believe that because the Bible tells me that, that there is a war raging for each one of our souls. And I think he's successful. Satan is subtle, and he is successful in so many ways at distracting us and keeping us from being hot or cold. Jesus said, hey, I'd just rather you be one or the other. You know, if you're going to do this, do it. If not, don't. Be all in or out. So in closing this morning, what would Jesus undo? I think it's spiritual indifference. Because it doesn't just break Jesus' heart, it makes him want to vomit. So what do we do this morning? What do, how do we reignite this spiritual fire in, in each one of us? And I, you know, I was reading through this, and, and, and one of the things I could list, you know, I could list a bunch of things like, well, you need to get in, you know, we need to get into our Bibles and start reading, and, and we need to spend time praying, and we need, to, we need to witness to people, and we need to fellowship, and we need to get in a grow group, and I want to talk about that. We're going to be leading up to this next four weeks. We're, we're, we're leading up to a point in time at, at, here at Salem Grace where we're going we're gonna to open up grow groups, and we're going to start talking about that a lot. You're going to start hearing that. We're going to give you an opportunity to sign up for a grow group, and I can talk about that, and I think those are great things, and I, I would encourage you to do that, and we need to give, we need to give, we need to tithe and, and worship, and we need to worship, and we can turn from our sins, and, and, and I could make a list of all these things that we need to do to reignite that fire, but there's really just one thing that I'm going to challenge you to do this week to reignite that fire, and it's this. Do something every day that requires faith. I want to challenge you to do something absolutely every day that requires faith. I don't know what that looks like for you, but I can tell you the momentum in my life when I have, the moment or the momentum that I have felt in my life or that moment when I have felt more alive and close to Jesus was when I was stepping out on faith and I was doing something that was scary and God asked me to do it and I said, I'm gonna trust you And then you will, and watch what happens when we begin to place our trust in Jesus. You know, we can focus on all these things. We can focus on reading our Bible and and doing good and coming to church more regular and stop cussing and stop flipping people off, whatever that is. We can focus on all that stuff. But really, there's one thing that we need to do, and that is focus on Jesus. 
Because he said, seek me first and all this will be added. And I believe wholeheartedly that if we do something, my challenge for you this week is to do something every day this week that requires faith. Because James said, faith, you know, faith without works is dead. I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe it's to stand up for something or someone when they're going to be mocked or, or maybe, it, it, maybe it looks like uh, giving a little bit extra in the offering plate out of, that's gonna stretch you or giving to somebody else that God tells you to give something to do. Maybe, maybe that means to apologize to somebody that you need to apologize to. Maybe it's gonna require some faith and forgive them when you don't really feel like you want to. Maybe it's to volunteer to pray out loud in your small group. Oh no, God, give me faith. Maybe it's just to show up at a small group. Maybe it's to actually get engaged with community and do life with people and start being a little bit vulnerable and sharing a little bit about yourself with somebody else and saying, hey, I need you to pray for me on that. And iron sharpening iron. Maybe it's to expose yourself to something that breaks your heart. Maybe it's to pray for something that's impossible. Maybe it's to attempt something that you could never do without God's help. Whatever it is for you, I want you to challenge you to do something this week that gets you out of your comfort zone and requires you to have faith. Because I believe when we do that, we will begin to experience the fullness and richness of Jesus Christ working through our lives and we will begin to appreciate the gift that we've been given. And ask the band to come up. You know, some most people believe that it's a lie. The lie that most people believe is that it's easier not to care. It's better not to get involved. I read a quote. It says, it's better to hurt with a purpose than to exist without one. <laughs> I'd rather have a purpose and hurt and suffer a little bit than to exist without one. I'm a believer, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, but there have been times in my life that I have been spiritually indifferent. And I know it's a tough message, but Revelations 3.19 says this. I don't know if Jesus is speaking to you this morning, but he spoke to me through this. And sometimes we need a good spanking. <laughs> Revelations 3.19 says I... I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Every day, do something that requires faith this week. Church in Laodicea, Jesus said, you say I am rich, I have required wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, and blind and naked. And so my question to you this morning is this. Am I, just ask yourself this question, if you would do this for me this morning. Am I a follower of Christ? Or am I wretched, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked? I'm going to ask you to stand this morning. Ask yourself that question. Which one are you? Am I a follower of Christ or am I wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked? Have I actually been changed by his love and his grace or have I not? And this morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm not going to make anybody feel awkward, but I'm going to give you an opportunity. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know if you're somebody who has never believed before and we have an opportunity. All you have to do is open the door. My dad on the dashboard of our lime green Datsun pickup <laughs> growing up had used one of those little punch things and put this verse. And every morning I read it going to school. And it was this verse. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come in eat 
with that person and they with me. We have that opportunity this morning. Maybe you're somebody that's a believer, you've been a Christian your whole life, and you've been faithful, and you've given tithe, and you've done things, and you've given up your time and effort and everything else, but the distractions of life and the stuff has gotten you to the place where you are just spiritually empty and indifferent. And quite honestly, you're lukewarm. I'm just going to give you a minute. I'm going to have everybody heads bowed. I'm not going to have Jeremy sing or anything like that. These altars are open. If that's you this morning and you want to come pray, I invite you to come now. Don't be ashamed of what other people think about you, remember? (laughs) Maybe you're just here and you just need to pray and ask God to relight that fire in our life and undo, ask Jesus to undo your spiritual indifference. I'm going to pray for you. Father, I just ask, Lord, that you would just move in and out of these rows this morning, that you would help us to do a self-check of ourselves. God, if, as we went through that list of criteria, Lord, there are things that I know I've been guilty of. And Father, I just ask you to forgive me. Father, just renew in me a steadfast spirit. Help me to focus on you and not to be distracted by the things that Satan puts in front of me in my life. Father, I just pray that you'd be with this church. And if there's somebody here this morning that would just say, you know, I didn't come forward, but I want to renew my life. I want to say a prayer. You would just say, God, please forgive me of my indifference. Forgive me of being lukewarm. Help me to focus on you. Help me to to put forth the effort that I need to daily to focus on you. Help me to find that one thing in my life that I can do that requires faith this week. Is there anybody that just prayed that prayer? Just lift your hand up so I can pray for you. Yep, I see it. Yep. Father, thank you for the honesty of these people. Lord, that meet them right here in this place. Help us not to leave here, Lord, with indifference still in our hearts. Challenge us, Lord. Draw us close to you. We love you. We're thankful for the gift of your son. I'm incredibly thankful for that. And help me never to take that for granted. Father, remind me of that daily, of the gift that you have given to us all so freely that we can be free people. Thank you for your love and your commitment to this place and for this church. And thank you for your challenging us this morning. Help us, Lord, to take what we've learned and apply it to our lives as we leave this place and draw us close to you again. In your precious holy.